particular tradition, the first approach is usually more uh, privileged than the other, so that people can understand. Yeah. It's mostly around the Western mind too, so that the Western mind can uh, uh, be okay with it. <laughs> Not talking about rebirth. <laughs> So one of the things why I, I'm saying this is because the word sanya, when I say this is the part of the mind that labels things and names things, it, it's actually a lot more than this. <laughs> the, the word sanya is a bit like the word sankara in the suttas. It's one of these words like dhamma. It means it means a teaching. It means a thing. It means a state. It means it means so many things. And so. We need to be a little flexible around these terms. So, <laughs> because when you read the suttas, when you read the suttas in Pali, then you really get to know, like, yeah, like, like they're obviously not using that word the way that we would use just that, the word perception, for example. Like, it's just impossible. It just doesn't work. So, <laughs> um, but in a lot of ways, it does work. So, uh, we'll be using that tonight. <laughs> So I particularly love this sutta on the path of origination, Paticca Samuppada, because it doesn't just talk about Paticca Samuppada, it also talks about the way out of it, <laughs> which is by far the most important. <laughs> we need to understand Paticca Samuppada, the way that things work, the law of causality, so that we can understand how we get basically to break free from it. And uh, usually I call this the origination of liberation, actually, because uh, it's the kind of the, the positive side of dependent origination. So, uh, is today you said causality? Causality, yes, the law of causality, yes, <clears throat> or the chain of causality, basically. But it goes beyond just uh, the, the classical dependent origination. And um, this is the, the, the topic of tonight's talk, is basically the ecosystem of freedom that we're going to look at. So, at Savati, this is a usual place for the Buddha to teach. And then he says, I say that it is by knowing and seeing monks that the mental distractions become still. Not by not knowing and not seeing. Knowing and seeing what? These are shapes. These are shapes arising. These are shapes passing away. These are felt experiences. These are felt experiencing experiences arising. These are felt experiences passing away. These are concepts, these are concepts arising, these are concepts passing away, perceptions. These are thoughts, these are thoughts arising, and these are thoughts passing away. This is consciousness, this is consciousness arising, this is consciousness passing away. Knowing and seeing in this way, monks, there is distilling of the distraction. And what I call the stilling of distractions here is the asavakai, basically the destruction of the taints, <laughs> which is usually called. Um, but like I was explaining, uh, I see the word asava much more like a flowing uh, kind of understanding. And the asavakaya is basically uh, the drying up of the which is another analogy that the Buddha used quite often. Like the, basically, the, that would be like almost literally the withering of the mental effluence, outflows, outpours, influxes, outfluxes, depending on how you want to say it. <laughs> but um, I think these are all actually pretty good. Um, nothing wrong with that. Uh, personally, the taints, it works, but it's not uh, my favorite. 
So, because the mind is active, it moves all over the place, like Bhante says, you have to recognize or remember to uh, see mind's attention, how it moves from one thing to another, basically. And really, that's a great uh, way to understand exactly this. So do you notice already something, um, maybe some of you notice already uh, some things that we've been talking about on interviews, when um, I would say, you know, these, these are just perceptions, they arise and they pass away, whether it's a light, whether it's like pixels, whether it's um, movement, geometrical patterns. <laughs> whether it's a kind of a visual imagery or whatever it is. I've been saying that quite a lot, in fact, on interviews. Uh, yeah, just cultivate to see that as just perception arising, passing away, not holding on to it, not making it, uh, pers not taking it personal, just seeing it for what it is and continue six Ring into your object of meditation, basically. <clears throat> and this is cultivating what we call anicca sanya, the perception of impermanence, which is tied to also not the perception of not taking things personal. The, these two are very close together. And this touches at the core of the Buddha's awakening, basically. So, and everybody else's awakening, uh, literally. When we stop taking things personal, we see how it's impermanent then it's easy to let go, actually. It's very easy. So this is a little bit more wisdom for us to, to chew on tonight. And so when... Um, I'm sorry, this was a little bit of a dry introduction, right? <laughs> Without a poem tonight. So harsh. <laughs> what is he doing? <laughs> So I don't have a poem for you tonight, but <laughs> I thought I would share a little uh, story um, because of this um, perception of impermanence actually is, there's all kinds of meditations that you could do for that. My personal favorite though is um, one that I've uh, just um, discovered. I always love bathing in rivers. So even though I read to you the sutta on not bathing in the rivers <laughs> earlier this retreat, um, I was, it was right before I ordained actually and uh, I was on an eight month retreat by myself at uh, my place and um, there was, there's a river where I'm from in uh, eastern Canada and uh, it was summertime and it was really beautiful and uh, I just went in the river and uh, it was hot so I just went to cool down and um, there was about this much water but just enough to cover my whole body without uh, needing to kind of uh, being able to breathe still basically <laughs> and um, I just basically uh, would uh, lay there and just not think at all and just feel the water flowing down everywhere on my body basically and I would just like see the open sky <laughs> that was it <laughs> open sky and feeling this flowing of water and to me, this was like one of the best uh, meditation on imp impermanence or on anicca sanya, where actually everything that we're experiencing is just like a river, like all these sensations that we're experiencing. If we you try to cling to it, it just like goes right through your fingers. But if you just allow it to be, then you can actually just be fully conscious of it. And that's it. And it's so simple. You don't need to try to hold on to it. You don't need to, you just, it's just, just flowing anyways. And so there's some things that we can align with. There's some things, you know, we can kind of nudge along here or there, but, um, and this was really blissful. This was really beautiful. There was no effort. There was no, you know, there, it was just like basically resting there. And that's why I call the satipatthana the resting places of awareness, because that's where our awareness simply rests naturally. You know, you don't have to do anything to feel your body. Actually, it's the opposite. 
is when you stop doing everything that you start feeling it. <laughs> and, and when we start understanding like that, meditation becomes very effortless. It becomes like it's a natural thing. You know, the four foundations of mindfulness, the four what I call the resting places of awareness, body. Well, if you let go of everything else in this world and all the distractions, you'll be aware of your whole body. It's just the coarsest thing you can experience here and now. If you didn't want to experience your body, you couldn't. <laughs> That's how true it is. And it's the same thing with everything that we experience at the sixth sense basis, Vedana. Anything that is experienced, everything that is felt, everything that is uh, sensed. Whether you like it or not, it's there. <laughs> so better accept it and better actually go with the flow. And it's the same thing with uh, mental states and it's the same thing with uh, the Dhamma, basically. However you want to translate that. But um, mental states, they, they, they simply are there. Uh, I mean, it's not... Uh, Yes, we can cultivate them, and that's the whole point of the path, yes. But then more and more we learn to detach from it. We learn to not make a big deal, even of our own mental states. So, and then we start to see also that would be basically citta nupasana, and then you have dhamma nupasana, which is seeing basically the way things work. You know, when the Buddha explains what the, those what Dhamma Nupasana is, he's just basically explaining all of the Dhamma. He's explaining, well, these are the hindrances, and then when they arise, you just know, these are hindrances. It's not me, it's just hindrances. <laughs> then there's the seven supports of awakening, then you see, well, this is how the mind gets collected, this is how it calms down, this is how it gets liberated. It's not me, it's just a process. <laughs> and more and more, the more we practice, the more we actually start to detach. We're not, like, we're still practicing, but we're not taking it so much as, I'm meditating, I'm doing this. More and more, it's going to be a lot more free and just being seen as a process, basically. And that comes with a lot of freedom, actually, in the first place, the more we understand this. So Chitta Nupasana, the Buddha would say, like he's, he would basically enumerate like all the kinds of mental states that you, one can be in. Like one, one's mind can be like agitated or calm. It can be collected or scattered, or it can be. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't remember all of them, but like angry or loving or all of the different states that it could be. And when these arise. Of course, we want to cultivate the wholesome, but when they arise, we don't, first of all, we don't make them a big deal. We just, we just notice, notice them for what they are and not trying to push them away, not try to suppress them, but uh, continue our practice with the right understanding. That's why it's called wise awareness or right mindfulness. It's because we're not trying to force this, we're just trying to understand what, how things work, what these things are. <laughs> Chitta Nupasana is basically, uh, yeah, the mental states, really. And then Dhamma Nupasana is uh, like the Dhamma uh, principles. It's like the five hindrances, the seven supports of awakening, the eightfold path. It's all these Dhamma principles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's like the inner working of the mind, like this, the software is happening. <laughs> So for one who doesn't see a self, basically, they see the four foundations of mindfulness. That's what happens. Basically, the sense of self is basically replaced by these four resting place, places of awareness. Uh, there's not going to be an I in there. There's just going to be, oh, this is body. These are sensations or experiences. Then there's going to be, oh, th this is the mental state. Oh, and this is Dhamma. Like, for example, one would sit down and meditate, and the mind would be like going a little bit like this. And then slowly, well, depending where one is in the practice, but slowly with six or 
basically being on like release autopilot. <laughs> um, the mind would just naturally, you know, it would, it would start becoming uplif uplifted because it's detached, viveka. And then, and then it would start experiencing gladness and joy. And then it would start experiencing relief and calm and then happiness. And then it would collect and then it would become steady. And then it would become aware more and more. But the thing is, that's a process. That's how the mind works. That's it. <laughs> and there, there's a way of doing this that, you know, there's a way of understanding this. This is like a universal principle. Like everybody here is the same thing. And you just sit down, you do the six R's, you do right effort. That's what's going to happen. And uh, the more you practice, the more we practice, the more we really start to see that as just, well, this is a, like a law of this is how things operate. And so I'm just going to sit here and do the practice. And uh, that's why we become more and more distant. And it's actually more free because we're not trying to see everything and get our hands in everything. And it's actually a lot more fun when you're just like, ah. <laughs> a lot lighter and it's a lot more sustainable too because you stop making a big deal out of everything trying to understand everything and control everything there's more and more space more and more freedom so next time you have a river that's got maybe this much water in it you can try it's really fun and then actually it stays with you you can if you do it a few times you'll start to notice like your whole body and how it's just flowing and it's just flowing and you can even add like a mind like an open sky to that <laughs> and that's pretty good <laughs> i don't know so i don't always come across uh clean uh rivers that got this much water but i try to do that every time i come across it so <laughs> Not that I think that it's purifying my sins, <laughs> but um, it does. It does do the trick of you know being just here and now without just because it's a little bit coarser with the water, so you can actually feel it more, and then it just stays with you. So it's really nice. <laughs> okay. Will you please repeat the four foundations of mindfulness? Yes, you mean uh, for yes. the what? what? Yes. So that bit, want to hear again? Just, just the list of Oh, okay, okay. So um, the first there is the body, knowing the body as body, letting go of all distractions or any inclination in this world. Then there is knowing sensations or experience as experience, sensation as sensation, feeling as feeling, whatever you, your kick is. And then there is mental states as mental states. And then there is what I call Dhamma as Dhamma or Dhamma principles as Dhamma principles. Yeah. All good? Uh, Vinaya. Oh, yes. You were talking about the five standards of, of the ego. Yes. I think, uh, Sounds. Yes, I know. I wasn't done. <laughs> I got super sidetracked. Ah? <laughs> huh? Yes, yes. There's a lot of numbers in the Buddha's teaching. Yeah, yeah. It's just the beginning. How many days do we have? There's so many things to talk about, guys. Like, <laughs> so when does this retreat end? You want to do it for uh, 20 days? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right, let's go. <laughs> mm, good, good, I like that. <laughs> yes, oh good. Half a day. The what? Dhamma talk. Dhamma talk, half a day. All right. <laughs> Interviews or? <laughs> okay, okay, <laughs> good. Yeah, I did that in Canada actually. There was a, we were doing a 10 day retreat and then they wanted a 14 day retreat in the end. And I was like, 
okay, let's do it. Can, but can I take a day off? <laughs> I just want to meditate one day. <laughs> and then we can start again. Um, yeah, that was a great retreat. Um, yeah, so basically, the, and it's, it's a good question, and it's kind of coming back to where we were, and the five fabrics, or the five aggregates, really, that's what it's usually called in English. I like the five fabrics of the ego, but that's just my own thing. Um, and in fact, these things are really close to the four foundations of mindfulness, the four satipatthanas, and Bhante would say that quite a lot. They're almost the same thing. The thing is that the Buddha explained a lot of different, had a lot of different ways of explaining very similar things, but he used them in slightly different ways, basically. So the four foundations of mindfulness is basically just like learning how, this is like right mindfulness, basically. This is samma sati. And so this is just learning to like understand and see reality for what it is. Yata Bhuta Jnana Dasana. So, uh, seeing, and this is going to be in the Sutta, which I barely started reading. <laughs> um, and then the five uh, aggregates are more like uh, related to discourses that he would really go towards either impermanence or really move towards uh, impersonality, anatta, uh, non self. Basically, he would use that for, for that, but they're so close together that it's, you know, there's a lot of overlap. Yes, so these are the Dhamma Pakiya Dhamma, Bodhi Pakiya Dhamma, yes, got it, reversed. <laughs> um, so the 37 things required for awakening, uh, these are basically the 37 or the seven groups of things that he uh, he taught that, that were part of mental development basically that was part of his path of bhavana uh, I just hope I can remember them all but uh, <laughs> so I think it is um, it's been a while the four faculties the seven supports of awakening the four right strivings the Eightfold Path. Um, hmm? The Four Foundations of Mindfulness. <laughs> huh? Yes, I, I said that. Right striving, right effort. Huh? Yes, the Idiparas. Um, I feel like there's another one, but... Uh, yes. Those are kind of like the same, basically. Yes. Yes. He, he has both ways of explaining it. Yeah. Usually, we find more suttas. We find more material on the Indriyas. The Bala is a little bit less. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So let's move on into dependent origination because uh, <laughs> we haven't started yet. So. Um, basically, I'll just cover your basis for the next two uh, aggregates, which are, um, yes, next two, uh, Sankara, basically. Um, uh, Bhante would call them thoughts, and um, formations or thoughts, depends. And this, this word, Sankara, is another one that's just, you know, what it means in the five aggregates and what it means in dependent origination is a little bit different and what it means in other places is, oh, oh, can also, uh, I like what it means in Marathi though. It's, isn't it like a bunch of junk? <laughs> I read that when I was looking at the, huh? Conditioning. Conditioning. But there's a way that you can say that it's junk, like a bunch of mud together with trash. I thought that was funny. <laughs> Anyways, I was looking at the, I use this uh, website, uh, Wisdom Library, and it has all of the, you know, when you look up a word, it has all the, like, what it means in Hinduism and uh, Vedic texts and uh, like all the Shastras and all of that. And there's like Marathi, what it means in uh, Hindi and Pali and Mahayana Buddhism and all of that. 
And so, um, yeah, that's, that's where I got that from. <laughs> I thought that, that was really funny. It's just a bunch of trash <laughs> together. <laughs> um, so, and then there's consciousness. So that this wraps up the, the five kandas. And this is, these are like, um, and that's why he says the panchupadana kandas. This, these are the things that we cling to as this is me, this is mine, this is myself. The body, everything that we experience is like this is mine, this is done to me. And then there is uh, perceptions, is like I am seeing this, I am, this is my glass of whatever. Um, and uh, our thoughts, we really definitely do associate with our thoughts, uh, big time. <laughs> and that's just a, a really interesting part of the path is to recognize that our thoughts are just completely conditioned. And this is what we're going to be talking about tonight. And then over top of that is consciousness. So even consciousness is fabricated, conditioned. It is arising from a cause. So. But monks, I say in this stillness, this knowledge of stilling comes from a cause. It is not independent. So basically the asavakaya, when there is no more mental movement, no more agitation in the mind at all, there is complete stillness. But how this comes from a cause, it is fed through something. What is the cause for the knowledge <clears throat> of this stillness? Release should be said. And I'll try to cover you with the Pali here. This is Vimutti. Uh, liberation, basically. I like release because it's a little bit more active than passive. Liberation is a great choice, but um, yeah. But this release comes from a cause. It is not independent. What is the cause for release? Freedom from clinging should be answered. And this is viraga. This is usually translated as dispassion. Freedom from clinging for me is a little bit more applicable. Uh, anyways, I'm not going to go into the dispassion uh, whole ordeal because that's going to take me a long time. But uh, <laughs> um, But this freedom from clinging comes from a cause. It is not independent. What is the cause for freedom from clinging? Disengagement should be answered. But this disengagement comes from a cause. It is not independent. See how he's just really going slowly, slowly through the whole thing here. Um, and disengagement here is Nibbida. Uh, what is sometimes called disenchantment or turning away or um, yeah it's, it's got a lot of nasty words too like disgust and things like that but uh, yeah <laughs> I like to keep on the bright side <laughs> I mean it's it's still relevant you know, like disengagement you know, you're like kind of okay like I'm, I'm okay with that actually I really liked um, Delson's uh, simile for that is like <clears throat> I'm uh, going to the kitchen and I'm making you a bowl of ice cream, really good ice cream, like whatever your favorite kind is, that's the one. And then I'm giving it to you and you're like, ooh, this is nice, and just eating it. And then, and then meanwhile, I'm going back to the kitchen and I'm serving you another bowl and then I'm coming back, putting it on the table and just like, sure, okay, I'll have another bowl of ice cream. And then, and then meanwhile, because it's taking a little bit longer this time, <laughs> making another bowl of ice cream in the kitchen. And then I put it on the table and you might take it uh, just out of respect, <laughs> saying like, yeah, okay, <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll get it down. <laughs> And then I go back to the kitchen and I pour you another massive bowl of ice cream and I put it on the table and you're like, okay, now that's enough. <laughs> I've got enough now. <laughs> this is also a good way of putting uh, nibida. Mm -hmm. I, like, I like this engagement because um, there's no viveka in this, but so the Buddha plays on words. He's not, he's not like 
that's why I said that I opened the talk on like don't make concrete out of any of this like uh, this is really close to Viveka actually uh, but Viveka doesn't come in this sutta so mm -hmm. that was last retreat in Bodh Gaya but I'm maybe he's saying that more I don't know I'm not <laughs> Chocolate for you. Yeah. <laughs> ice cream. Yes, ice yes, cream. yes, yes. No, what? Now we know your favorite flavor. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> what is the cause? Okay, so yes, disengagement. What is the cause of disengagement for disengagement? Discernment should be answered, and this is what I translate. A yata bhuta jnana dasanang, which is a quite uh, a mouthful to say uh, basically knowing and seeing things as they really are. <laughs> but um, in my own translations, I um, translate the word panya as discernment because the word wisdom is just awfully huge. You can say a lot of things about wisdom, it doesn't you know, like, what's wisdom? I mean, there's all kinds of wisdom out there. Uh, so what are we talking? Like, <laughs> and um, Panya also means discernment, and that really ties into discerning what states are arising in your mind. And when you do say wisdom, then what are we talking about? Nobody knows. Uh, unless you're like a poly, you know, scholar or something like that, you know. So uh, I really prefer discernment and yata bhuta jnana dasanang is basically a synonym for also discernment, like knowing things for what they are. There's a hindrance arising, it's not you, it's a hindrance, it's condition. There's, uh, there's the mind getting collected, there's the seven supports of awakening. You know how to practice this so it arises, so that's it. So, um, Here, we, we uh, disengage through knowing how things work. Basically, that's how we do it. That's how, because if we don't have that discernment, there's no way we're going we're gonna to know which states are wholesome when there's tension arising. That's the recognizing step, basically, of the six R's. And uh, for those of you who already know Paticca Samuppada, or dependent origination, yeah. This is basically the opposite of avijja. This is the opposite of not knowing. This is the opposite of uh, lack of awareness, which we'll see in a moment. But this discernment comes from a cause. It is not independent. What is the cause for discernment? Mental collectedness should be answered. And that is samadhi. Yes, yes. If the mind is scattered, how can we know things? How can we discern things as they are? It's like, um, it's like when you're speeding down the highway at 150 kilometers per hour. Can you see like the little bug that's standing on the tip of the blade grass there? No, <laughs> you can't because you're just going too fast. <laughs> but if you're just walking by the roadside and then you might notice like, oh, there's these things happening and Samadhi is the same thing. It's actually calming the mind, gathering it on its own, and then we see things very clearly. Vipassana. Good. Yes. No, no, no. Yes. Dis disenchantment of what? Yeah, that's why I like disengagement. Because it's more like, um, it's more tied to like actual release. Just releasing, basically. It can be understood as, disenchant as disenchantment, yes. But disenchantment, basically, that, that's the thing is that we have to start to get heady about it if we talk, if we call it disenchantment. <laughs> because... It, so was it really just the... <laughs> what are we talking about? 
I just disengage here for a moment. <laughs> See, that's what happens. <laughs> so um, when we start to see things as they are with discernment, basically these two things, they're the same thing, uh, we start to let go because we start that it's, uh, we start to see that it's, that's why he starts with the anicca sanya, because when the mind is still, we can see that it's always moving, moving, changing, changing, anicca, anicca. We're all vipassana students here anyway, so <laughs> we're all familiar with that. Anicca, anicca. And so, um, what happens here is that we just, uh, by seeing that all the time, we, be, we detach. So whether you want to call it disenchantment or whether you want to call it disengagement or detachment, like I said, it's really close to viveka. Oh yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, you just have enough, basically. You're satiated with it. You get wary of it, basically. It's like, okay, I get it. It's just going to flow anyways. <laughs> like, uh, we, we usually get, like, try to grab things, you know, try to, and that's the f why we say freedom from clinging after that. But we, we try to grab these things. We try to grab all the experiences, perceptions, feelings, consciousness, thoughts, we try to grab it all and say, this is me, this is mine, this is... But actually the reality is it's all flowing, it's all going. And when we start to see with discernment, we start to detach, we start to let go. And this is why he starts this sutta with Anicca Sanya, with the five. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if we take the example of the ice cream, it can very well mean that too, but I'm being told that I should keep things uh, understandable for normal people. So, <laughs> um, so I'm not going in that direction. <laughs> uh, yeah, and it just keeps it more applicable here now. Everybody knows ice cream. <laughs> so if we, yeah, if we take the example of ice cream, it's the same thing, basically. It's just, we, we just, we also, we also just, like we, we we're fed up with it it's just like the ice cream becomes like kind of a metaphor for all of you know the transient transient nature of all experiences basically it only goes so far <laughs> I have to say the analogy of the ice cream don't try to push it that far <laughs> it's a great one but <laughs> it has its limits <laughs> so Okay, mental, we were on mental collectedness now. Everybody's following. So it is not independent. So what is the cause for that? And so what is the cause for mental collectedness? This is the quiz. Because we are chasing. I said it a few times. Samadhi. Yes, samadhi. What is the cause for samadhi? Practicing and following the program. Yes, right. yes, getting right. closer. Huh? Yes, getting close, getting close, but it's six R, yeah, it's, it's, it's not wrong, it's not wrong, but it's more specific. It's more specific and it's a, it's a very specific sequence that happens. It's so is it uh, through being uh, unhappy that the mind gets collected? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's getting close, getting close. How do you do that? <laughs> Oh, yeah, no, it's a really, it's a one word. 
Oh, yes, I'm liking this. Now you're working. <laughs> Following the precepts. Yes, yes, there is a sutta actually that, uh, that would say that, but it's not this one. It's not this one. Tranquility, yes, and now it's getting closer. It's in between tranquility and samadhi. Ah? Ah? The light in the oh, you're burning. You're burning really close, really close. <laughs> oh, well, it's uh, like the evolution, the evolution of joy. What is it? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Sukha. Ah, there we go. Happiness, ease. Yes, yes, Sukhino Chittang Samadhyati. Ah. This is like the best, like if there's one Pali sentence you want to memorize in your whole life, <laughs> that one is pretty good. <laughs> the happy mind gets collected, basically that's what it means. It's a Tasime Panchani Varane Pahine Atta Samanupassano if I'm not wrong, I'm sorry if I did a mistake. But um, Pamoja Jayati. Pamodita sa piti jayati. Piti manasang kayo pasambati. Pasada kayo sukang patisang wedeti. Or patisang wedi? Okay, I'm not sure. <laughs> and then sukino chitang samadhiati. That, I call it the gladness to collectedness sequence. So whenever the five hindrances are abandoned uh, and one sees that within oneself, then there's relief, then there's gladness, pamoja, piti, and then there's tranquility, and there's calm, the mind calms down, and then there's ease, there's happiness, sukha, and then sukhino chittang samadhyati, then the mind gets collected. This is how the Buddha said, very, very, very clearly, distinctly, without a mistake, that's how it happens. <laughs> but uh, I guess we kind of missed it. <laughs> yeah, it's so clear. Actually, uh, like a lot of my research, research has been around that sequence. And um, I, I'm still writing it. I've been writing that book for like three years now. But I'm just pulling all of the suttas that has that sequence in it. And it's all going to be in one place, and uh, we're just going to really talk a lot about it. <laughs> and um, basically, in the Diga Nikaya, the first chapter, there's 13 suttas, and except from the Brahmajala, the first one, the 12 next, all have that sequence in it. When the Buddha is explaining the whole of the path that he discovered and that he taught, uh, which is usually the path that he said, the discourse he said when hundreds of people had the Dhamma Chakku arise because he explained the whole path and then, then they understood the Dhamma. Uh, and that sequence is in there and it's actually connected to the first jhana. There's no dot, there's no period, there's no nothing. It's like it's part of the first, like how you get into the first jhana. Uh, and the, the only thing, though, is that why it's so overlooked is that uh, the next sutta, because it's so long, it's the long discourses, right? So, <laughs> so you'd have like a book like this if you just didn't like a bridge <laughs> here and there. And so basically, since the, in the Samanya Pala Sutta, the fruits of the like contemplative life, uh, it's all explained, the whole thing is just like blah. And you have the whole story there about the whole path. Then the next sutta, they just write pay dot dot dot. <laughs> so, so payala means like repetition. And you know, of course, at that time it was all recited orally, so it makes sense that when you write it on paper, you kind of want to save the paper because you just wrote it and it took you like five days or something. So, <laughs> on like palm leaf manuscript, and you have to like have to be really careful and not to kind of s split it and things like that. So, um, so it's just abridged and so poop, it disappeared. <laughs> so we don't really put attention to it. And then when you talk about 
that sequence through monks, for example, because it's so overlooked, like it's so kind of not well understood that this is really how the mind gets collected because nobody's really experiencing that or very few people. Uh, monks will say, oh, well, this is the blessing of being a monk, you know, this is, you know, this is how, this is the joy of being a monk, this is, the only people that can experience that is monks, but it's not true, <laughs> everybody can, you just have to know. <laughs> so, and that's why here, this, the genius of this twin practice is actually without, I never heard Bhante really mentioning about that sequence, I just kind of found that, but it's in the Anapanasati Sutta and that's how he discovered that and he turned it into the six R's and the principle of joy basically of smiling is extremely important that's why we put so much emphasis on it because that's how the mind gets collected period like that's just how it happens so if you're happy if you're smiling like everything's gonna be fine and then you'll, you won't have to do anything your mind is gonna be collected it's just that easy but but we have to practice, we have to do it, and it doesn't take five minutes. <laughs> and so, so we have to be a little patient and, you know, like three, four days, usually that's when you see like people start to get it. They, they start to be, actually, they become bright. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's really beautiful to see actually. But the metta and the smiling, the, you can tell. You can tell when people get it. It's like, phew, they're just beaming. <laughs> and their mind is just straight, you know? <laughs> and they're happy, they're smiling, they're just like, wow, okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Hasna karanahe, mus karanahe, kushi karanahe. I don't know how to say good up, ah, acha. <laughs> Good. <laughs> now you know everything. <laughs> um, good. Yes. <laughs> so, you get a second try. What is the cause for mental collectedness? Sukha. Yes. <laughs> good, good. Happiness. Ease, basically. Uh, like the, yes, yes. And just, by the way, it's in a lot more suttas than just the first 12 of the Diga Nikaya. Like, a lot more. Like, way more. Um, so, without more delay, happiness should be answered. But this happiness comes from a cause. It is not independent. What is the cause for happiness or sukha, ease? It came from there earlier. Yes, calm, pasadi, pasadi, pasada kayo, sukang patisang wedi, patisang wedi, wedi, wedati. Oh, hmm, okay, good. So calm, calm. But this calm comes from a cause. It is not independent. What is the cause for calm or tranquility? Basadi. What is the... Huh? Uh -huh. he, he's got it. <laughs> oh, now a bunch of people got it. It's like, a, it's, it's even better because it comes twice. <laughs> it's... Yeah, huh? Piti, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sukha is not enough. You need the piti before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's that clear. <laughs> yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Piti, piti, the joy, the cleansing agent of the mind. Then, when it does its job for quite a while, then the mind and the body, they just like, ah, pasadi, and then sukha. So that's the thing, but you, we need the, the cleaning agent. Yes, smile. <laughs> You're good. You passed the test. <laughs> Very good. But this joy comes from a cause. It is not independent. 
What is the cause for joy from PP? Uh, I heard it. I just heard it. Huh? Uh, well, it's that, that's usually associated in the first jhana. Delighted. But, huh? Delighted? Yeah, it's close, close, close. It's, it's in the same lines, actually. Yes, yes, the delight would be kind of. That actually comes from in another sutta called the Kusalani Silani, like the skillful virtues. This would be like just be after that. But from following the virtues, there happens something like the, Yes, 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 gladness, gladness, exactly, Pamoja. Pamoja. Relief or gladness. It depends. I translate it as relief when he talks about letting go of the five hindrances because of the five similes that he talks about. It's like being freed from debt, finding an oasis in the desert. Um, hmm? Yes, free from pr prison or, you know, like these things. That's really like pointing to relief so much. But then there's other suttas where that same sequence arises. He talks about recollecting the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. And there I translate it more as gladness, pamoja. Because it's, yeah, it's, it could be relief too, but it's kind of more appropriate or more in line that it's basically it's gladdening the mind to recollect the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, the virtues. So it's going to, yeah. It's a, and it's found really in a, in a lot of places. So, so that I, I just want to put an emphasis on this. So th there's pamoja, pamoja, and then there's also piti, and then there's also sukha, right? So it's pretty clear. <laughs> it's, yeah, I don't think there's any clearer than that. But this relief, this pamoja, comes from a cause also. And it is not independent. It just doesn't arise just like that. What is the cause for relief? Now I'm going to help you a little bit because this is going to like a funky tra transition here. It's, a, it's a less known here. So here he says confidence or sadda. And Sadda is, um, so this, is, this ties into, because he mentions that sequence so much about uh, recollecting the good qualities of the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. So that, you know, he's talking about that confidence there. Uh, that, that's going to arouse the um, Pamoja, basically, the gladness. But what happens before that? So what's the breaking point where the seek happen, happens, the seeking happens, the searching happens for the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. Because there's, there's something happening. Hmm? Samvega. Oh, this is really good. Actually, this is really good. This is, it's really close. Uh, it's not exactly this, but it's, it's really close. So this is when we're getting into the deep down uh, Paticca Samuppada, dependent origination. The, we're starting the... the uh, the, the flip side of it, <laughs> the, the, the other end of the spectrum. <laughs> huh? Suffering. Suffering. Yes, yes. What, what drags us to find a way to figure something out of whatever is happening in our lives? Um, it doesn't have to be like completely crazy. Uh, some of them, yes, sometimes it is. But sometimes it can also be milder, but it, it's always associated with some level of, you know, you're not okay, you know, you're, you, like, you're fine, you, you want to find meaning, or you want to, you know, because you, you see that there's dukkha, basically, somehow, and you want to get out of it, which is really wholesome. So, what is the cause for confidence? Trouble should be answered. I usually have the light lighter note <laughs> suffering for me like I don't know about you guys but <laughs> suffering for me is like uh, putting like a slice of bacon and a searing pan on the stove you know it's like like you're suffering kind of thing it's like really intense but dukkha you know it's not suffering per se it's just like unpleasant you know it's like sukha dukkha 
you know, pleasant, unpleasant. It doesn't mean suffering. Suffering is like there's other words for that in Pali, like a lot of them. But, you know, dukkha doesn't necessarily mean suffering. I don't know why we got stuck with that translation. It's kind of strange, actually. But personally, I really like trouble because it's really applicable here and now in our daily life. It doesn't mean that you're suffering, but there's a problem. There's something. You're not, you're not okay. You want to change it. And so, so, and so this is how we gain faith. This is how there's that faith arising. And there's all, all kinds of things we can say about that. But let's go into <laughs> dependent origination. <laughs> yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. And what is the cause? Oh, oh, yes. Is that why Sundarbana has faith? The reason why he is unchanging just now. Yes. That is why his faith is unchanging. Because he has seen it. Mm -hmm. Just a connection. Yeah, well, to, to any level, like if we speak of a sort of, this is to any level, really. This is, doesn't mean that. Uh, one needs to be anything, really. It just needs to see. Mm -hmm. um, but, because uh, there's, there's a few levels, too, before Sotapanna. So there's a, there's a Dhamma follower, uh, there's a faith follower, there's Dhamma follower, then there's Sotapatti. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, uh, Sotapanna would, would definitely know, know this. Mm -hmm. Well, the more we, the more we deepen the path, the more that this is what we understand, basically. Yeah, yeah. and this, and and that's why I really like the Sanguega too, because it's it's really accurate. This is this is really where it arises. It's like that urgency. Sanguega means the sense of urgency to like actually put things into action, to change, basically. Um, Mahamogalana with the see uh, some monks just procrastinating in the, in the buildings of the monastery in Jet, Jetavana. And um, they were just like idle talking and things like that. And uh, he just like, uses psychic powers and go and uh, go inside and not say anything and uh, kick the, the wall with his, the tip of his toe. And then the whole building would just like <laughs> starts to shake and the monks are like, that's Sangwega. <laughs> the meditate monks. <laughs> so I just remembered that this is the part that um, it would be good if you had a pen, because then you could write um, my own translation on top of the graph, basically. What, because the, the graph is the graph. It's still good. I'm not saying that these words are not good, but um, I like to share my own uh, understanding of it too, and I think it's more accessible a little bit. So, if I think there are pens here too, but uh -huh. okay. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, sure, yeah. Because we already started. Now we're talking about trouble. So when. This is going to be an interactive little, uh, <laughs> well, it already is, as you can tell. <laughs> but um, uh, later, when we go through all of this, uh, we will repeat it all together. And uh, it's going to be a, it's kind of a tradition uh, in, our, uh, <laughs> in our retreats. So just so that everybody it gets into your mind by repeating it. Uh, everybody ready? OK, good. So we already have trouble. So on top of suffering, dukkha, you can write trouble. And then when you read my translations, you'll know. And if you like the word suffering, you can. Aging and death. And then that's because there's this uh, one bit missing. Yes, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. It isn't seeing dukkha. It is in 12th link. Yes, yes. I don't even have the graph. <laughs> Aye, very good. Ah. Aging and death, yes. I guess we're, we're a little too soon. We, yeah, I, I would... I would uh, yeah, that, that last bit. You can, you can write dukkha after... And yeah, 
between uh, yeah. I would put death into uh, the category of suffering <laughs> or dukkha at least at least unpleasant <laughs> Okay, so we're not really in the graph yet, so you're all good. <laughs> but you can write trouble, suffering. Uh, I would suggest uh, either beside or on top. It's kind of like, mm, we're not totally there yet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because uh, usually it's this super long, sandy, like a compound of, you know, uh, yeah, jara maranang. Yes. Hmm? Dukkha. Yes. Dukkha. Paridewa. Huh? So, let's move on. What is the cause for trouble? Oh, now it's getting interesting. Huh? Avidya. Um, Actually, we're starting on the other end. <laughs> yeah. Well, it is, but it's <laughs> <laughs> technically it is. It's under everything. But <laughs> uh, just want to check something here. Birth. Yes. Okay. So Bhante Vimala Ramsey would call this the birth of action, basically. Huh? Um, I call it uh, also blind reactions or reaction, basically. And This is what I've been saying uh, or explaining on interviews, this, a, a few of you, I think, um, that, you know, when we, uh, well, I would have to talk about the other one too, so, okay. So blind reactions should be answered or the birth of action, taking action, that's that reaction that basically Something happens, and because of your past conditioning, boom, it, it's already too late. You're already doing it. So, but, the, but blind reactions come from a cause, or these, this taking that step, taking action, it comes from a cause. What is that cause? They are not independent. What is the cause for blind reaction or taking action? Bhante would say habitual tendencies. I say habit patterns, same, very similar. Habitual tendencies should be answered. And this is where um, we can understand a little bit more uh, when we have this conditioning, then we're not very mindful. <laughs> That's the nature of it being conditioned is that uh, it's like uh, the volume gauge on an amplifier, huh? for those who are into music. <laughs> it's like when there's a lot of craving, <laughs> like it's cranked to, to the top and it's hitting the red all the time. <laughs> or it's barely coming down. And that's really strong. So when we feed that dependent origination, the whole thing, really strongly with a lot of volume to the craving or to the, the wanting, the, you know, this, that strength, then the stronger these blind reactions are and then we take action there's jati there's birth of action there's taking reactions basically it's like somebody shouts your name and you just like punch them hopefully not <laughs> but, <laughs> but that would be like probably like the best example of like really completely like blind reaction there's no mindfulness you, you get angry overrun completely like there's no sense of like in that in that moment that person is not acting with a straight mind basically they're intoxicated with anger so that's how it works and that's applicable for a lot of different situations and that's the mundane way of seeing a dependent origination that you can work with here and now so basically um, that can be also uh, your mom has been making you apple pie since you were three years old and it's your favorite dessert and when you see it at the store it's like boom 
you're not even thinking you're getting it it's like that it's like that i was just trying to find an example that's like not just anger and that's also applicable for other you know uh hindrances like desiring like uh, something it could be anything uh okay so these these reaction these blind reactions that taking action is it's already too late it's already kind of like you it's conditioned so much that you're just doing it but slowly as we're uh, making the mind wholesome and more aware we that's that's exactly what happens we start to notice these things we start to notice hey like okay is that really wholesome like if I punch that person, is it really going to benefit me and him? And, you know, is it actually going to change something? And then we, we learn to change, basically. But this is what happens. Yes, yes. I mean, I wasn't going to go there, but... Uh, <laughs> This is also jati, basically. So for those of you who like the, the more transcendental uh, approach, which means, uh, which is what the Buddha actually talked about. Uh, basically, because there's a few tweaks to that, and then I would have to kind of talk about the, the, the other ones below that, because uh, I like to kind of change them if we talk about the more transcendental one. But basically, it's that sense of identity. And when you have that sense of identity, that bhava, because sometimes I will translate bhava as identity, because this is where it arises. And bhava, that's what it means, that existing, that existence. That's, I sometimes call it like the, that sense of beingness. Like I, hmm? Personality, yes, yes. Personality, beingness, I amness. Like this, this thing that we think it's me, basically. And we're going to go deeper into this, but when that, that is kind of solidified to a certain extent, I mean, th this is going to carry through, basically, into birth, jati. Uh, so that's, that's the process, basically, of consciousness, which the, this body will break up, but then the, the, the consciousness has a momentum towards taking this. These, that's why you can see babies uh, with personalities. Like they literally have, well, all of them have, <laughs> like uh, totally. Uh, yeah, like I have uh, my uh, younger nephews, like they were born and you could tell like their personalities. Like, and that's, that's from there. That's from Bhava. That's from previous lifetimes. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Yes, well, I mean, and it's funny because there, there is more and more like a proof actually of uh, rebirth. Like there, there, there are like monks, uh, or not just monks, but there are definitely people remembering their past lives and things like that. Yeah, there's many of them. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yes, mm, yes, 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 mm -hmm. yeah, well, there, you know, there is some fantasies to that because it's become, you know, like, uh, there's so, some traditions, it's become kind of a norm that you go and seek out, you know, like the, where is he reborn, and like, does it, is it actually accurate, who knows, like they, yes, they are what? <laughs> I mean, if, if you look near the experience of people, uh -huh. like they leave this body and uh -huh. go bigger and bigger. Uh -huh. Yeah. That's, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Here we are. Let's go. Transcend, transcendental dependent origination now. Yeah, actually, I, I, I don't believe in those things. But yeah. maybe, uh -huh. I heard that near the experience. <laughs> Yeah, 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 totally. I've heard tons of stories like that, but I mean, I don't, I don't usually talk about it. 
I know there's a monk in, in India, in the Mahabodhi uh, society, actually, who remembered uh, where he, like, his previous life and uh, where he passed away. He died in a f uh, building fire, basically, and they actually tracked back like, the whole thing. They saw, like, yeah, that's uh, in the papers and all, and he said, like, the exact place and what happened and who he was, and, and that was it. Like, you know, he was there. Mm -hmm. I don't know his name. They, uh, we don't say these things. We can't. We can't say. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> obviously, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So, uh, a little digression here. Um, so, if we go back to the mundane, this is let's keep it in this world and uh, in our direct experience. So, uh, these blind reactions come from conditioning, habit patterns, habitual tendencies. And these are really like, uh, they're kind of like, a, they're already kind of crystallized. But there's things under that that make it, that crystallize it. So, but these are, uh, what is the cause for habit patterns or habitual tendencies? Now the usual way would be clinging. Clinging should be answered. I say, I call upadana here attachments. All of your attachments. I like chocolate ice cream. I am a carpenter. I drive only BMWs. <laughs> I only wear blue. This is my favorite color. These are examples. I'm not lying, by the way. I'm just not me, but. Uh, <laughs> um, um, I'm an orange juice kind of guy. <laughs> That's an attachment. <laughs> well, it can be an. There's ways it can be and there's ways it cannot be. It can be just an expression too, but most likely it will come with that attachment. And I mean, clinging, attachment, I think you see the connection, it's pretty close. Uh, for me, a lot of my students uh, like attachment a lot more because that's what we actually talk about usually. <laughs> clinging is like, yeah, it's again another like out there concept that we, it's hard to integrate. Uh, so, it can be, but, uh, yeah. But one thing, you, you still have, you still have, have a personality if you're awakened. So I suppose you're just not attached to aspects of your personality. Yeah. Like, well, you can't just suddenly just move it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that, what you're saying is, there won't be the identification of the attachment. Yeah. So like, getting irritated, it doesn't go my way. Yeah. Well, it, like if you say, I'm an orange juice kind of person, mm -hmm. and then there's a way you can say that as just an expression that fits a context, and maybe there's no real craving behind that. Maybe it's just something you've been saying all your life. And yeah, your body likes orange juice, whatever. Yeah. So, but there's a way that you can say it that you actually mean that you really like orange juice, and that's all you want to drink. <laughs> then that's an attachment. But yeah, then you know, like the, all the arahants, you know, all the liberated people, the the fully awakened people, they still had some, you know, like they still had their same body, they still have, you know, the same things going on, but they, they just don't have greed, hate, and delusion anymore. So they still probably feel like something, like 
if your body is such like I know if I stand in the sun for example like in the really hot sun my body's just gonna burn because <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and if I do that for an hour, like, uh, yeah, I'm just going to burn or two hours. And that's just a fact. So it's not because, like, it's, it's kind of a necessity. I could develop an attachment around that. Like, yeah, I, I really can't go in the sun and it's like really not good for me. And my mom says that all the time <laughs> or like something like that. <laughs> or you could just be like an arhat that knows that just don't stand in the sun, it's going to be painful, like, don't, don't do that, like, because Arahants, even though they don't have a great hate and delusion, they're liberated, they're not looking to, for, cra uh, for pain, you know, like, they're not, they still know what, like, this body needs, for example, like, if, if uh, citrus fruit, like, if you're allergic to something, or if you, something doesn't go down well, you still, you know, it's still the same thing. So, to that extent, that is still there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One more thing, same little bit. <coughs> like, let us say, uh, oh, one person has gone, got the state of Arahant. Mm -hmm. Can he have an intimate relationship with family members? Like, uh, he could able to speak? Uh, <coughs> like, to function in the family environment? Is that what you're saying? Like, to have an interactions with. Yes. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. Uh, I mean, whether that person would be in the robes or not, it would still be possible, but there's just no, you know, at that level, depending on past causes and conditions, obviously, like, we're, we're not in the time of the Buddha, like, things are very different right now. Um, but definitely the, um, the usual way of life would be seen as you know not really appealing like just like a, yeah because you don't have any sense desires you don't have any like what you want is dhamma basically it's just freedom of mind and whatever way that that's going to happen is probably just going to be like uh, the way you're going to take basically um yeah I don't know, like we could go really far into that question, but yeah, let's... Uh, <laughs> and I know, I know someone who could probably answer that, yes? Yes, yes, yes. So, the way we typically react yes. to, say, a stimulus yes. is, uh, that, that's, it's, this is probably what describes that, right? It's a reaction. It's yes, the jati, the jati part, yes. It's the nature of the relationship or the interaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically at that at that point, it's just like uh, it's just kind of too late. It's like it's already in the flow, in the making, yeah, in motion. Yeah, you can't really stop the ball. It's uh, um, yes. Then then we have attachments. Then as we pile up these attachments, right? This is when in like the transcendental kind of view of it, this is where we build that sense of identity. And this is really interesting because identity, me, is just a bundle of attachments. <laughs> that's all it is. That's all it is. It's nothing less. And that's why I really like the painting in the Jetvan in the front there, the Buddha painting. It has the story of the Buddha but it's his face and that's representing that point extremely well it's all the stories we make about ourselves the things that we like and we don't like that we've come up with like i like apple crisp because my mom's been doing it for me and that that's me like that's part of me that's like uh and then uh and then i'm an uh, i'm an engineer or i'm a this or that i'm a teacher i'm a I, I'm, I am a student in uh, yeah, university. 
near-death experiences. This is no, <laughs> I don't know. Why. Um, I'm a monk. Yeah, that's another good one. <laughs> and um, and all of this put together, this is identity. And from that identity, we take action, because that's what identity does. It's like, well. I do love ice cream, so I'm going to go get some. So <laughs> that's the not transcendental one. <laughs> but you can also see it transcendentally where, you know, that kind of package of me, myness, I, beingness, identity, personality would just carry through. Like my younger nephew, Louis, he's just like his mom, basically. He's just like, he's got the same emotional package, like it's the same thing. And he's, he's just like acting the same way. And, um, and, and it was like that, like he was one year old and he was acting like that. So it was really clear. And my, the other one is just like his dad, basically. And it's that same package. And like, uh, of course, there's some differences, but, and then as they interact together, they kind of pick it up too. <laughs> but that's just the circle keep going. But really that being came from causes and condition that brought him there. And it already had that bundle, that package of attachment, which is called identity, basically. So, okay. <laughs> what is the cause for attachments or clinging? So I called it, uh, hmm. Yeah, I thought it was something else I wrote. I, I called it here wanting, basically. I want this, I want that. I don't want this, I don't want that. I like it, I don't like it. Bante would say it's the I like it, I don't like it mind. And this is where it starts. So if sometimes I call it discontent because there's, um, it's not being okay, it's not being content here and now. You just like, there's an inclination. It's not like this. It's like, no, I want, no. And that arises upon wanting comes from a cause. It is not independent. So for having wanting to arise, we need uh, certain causes and conditions. And that is, uh, I thought you were going to students. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there we go. Vedana, Vedana, yes, yes. I call it uh, felt experiences here, felt experiences or experiences, feeling or sensations here, but sensation is a lot more than just bodily sensations, tingling sensation, it's a lot more than that. It's actually Vedana is, is really close to, the, to just like, well, experience, experiencing, uh, knowing Ved, the, the, the root. The root of Vedana is Ved, so to know. <clears throat> the knowingness, the experience. But all these, okay, so there's, there's a felt experience that arises. There's something that is felt. There's something that is experienced. There's something that, is, uh, that arises. And because of that experience, then there is an inclination. Then there is, but it, the inclination itself, it cannot arise if if there is no, uh, if there is no uh, ground for it. So, yeah, if there is no, yeah. So what is the cause of all felt experiences or all experience? Contact, yeah, sensory contact should be answered. And now we're getting a little deeper. Now here is where um, uh, all, all of the above from um, felt experience or Vedana, this is where we had a choice. <laughs> this is where we had the choice to break the chain, to loosen the chain, to let go of the chain, to dilute uh, our experience, to make it more wholesome. So it's not just like uh, you got a felt experience and boom, you got a craving. That's not the end of your life here. <laughs> There's the path. Right there is the path. The path happens. So, and that's where we weaken the chain. So we turn down the volume and then it doesn't like 
pop in the red all the time. So it, it just starts to get calmer and calmer. The sense of identity gets loosened up. There's no crazy reaction, blind reactions to anger, rage, or jealousy, or hatred, or really huge sense desires, or lust, unco uncontrollable lust. Um, then these things calm down, and then the sense of identity breaks up, open, and then it loosens up. There's a lot more happiness, a lot more spaciousness. Then the attachments, they're just like, mm, they dwindle, they calm down. It's like, yeah, I like this, but I'm okay. <laughs> I'm okay too, <laughs> without it. And then, and then craving, we start to see the craving sooner, before it arises. And we see, uh, we see it through the lens of wisdom, oh, discernment. <laughs> so it is, oh, there's that tension. Tanha. I, I love that it's actually close to, like, it's not really, because I, I looked it up. Like, semantically, it doesn't, uh, doesn't work, but it kind of does tanha and tension. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's thirst, really. But, uh, yeah. Yes, I can't translate, but he can. <laughs> Maybe sometime somebody can get on it and uh, I don't know. I don't know. When we have more time, we're already past two hours. Yo. Okay, very good. Ah. That's what happens with dependent origination. Mm. Yes, okay, so. What is the cause of all felt experiences, or all experience, or all feeling? Sensory contact, yes. Oh yeah, we said that. <laughs> Should be answered. But this sensory contact comes from a cause. It is not independent. And so that's, yeah, okay, I remember why. Uh, we stop there is because I was saying that beyond Vedana, beyond just the raw data of life that is coming at us from the six sense bases, either the eye, the nose, the ear, the tongue, the body, or the mind, all, all the time, raw contact, raw uh, information arriving. From there, we have the choice. We can practice the path or we can go into the craving. So, but here, as we go down, as we dive down a little deeper, then this is just basically past karma. This is just, uh, this is just happening. So we can't really change that. You can't, you can't just say like, contact, stop. It's not gonna stop, sorry. I mean, in the later stage when one enters Nibbana, like mental contact stops, but that's not what I'm talking about. So technically, as jati happens, like you are born with a body, with faculties, there's going to be contact, unless, unless that stops happening. But uh, yeah, okay, let's not go too deep into that. <laughs> what is the cause of sensory contact? So what do, what do we need? to have contact. I just said it actually in what I said. The six senses, yes. So that I keep the same, the six senses. The six-fold base, yeah, that's the, yeah, the six-fold base. Should be answered, the six senses should be answered. But these six senses come from a cause. They are not independent. So what do we need to have to have six senses? And I just said it too. Huh? Nama Rupa. Yes, mentality, materiality. I say mind and body, just because it's a little. Uh, Can you call perception here? Perception? Hmm? Well, if we break it down, I'm I'm not gonna like. I'm not going to break it down through this chart yet. Uh, that might be another talk, but uh, we're already taking uh, quite a bit of time. Yeah. 
So this mind and body, basically body rupa, what is rupa? It's basically the four elements. It's nothing more. That's what the Buddha said. You, we should train to understand that this body, this rupa, this form, this image, however you want to call it, is nothing but the four elements. The earth, the air, the fire, and the water, all working together. The earth is anything solid, your bones, your skin, your blood is the water, or anything that is liquid. Then the fire, Buddha said, is the digestion, that agni, the heat. Yes, yeah, for those of you who are familiar with Ayurvedic systems, probably all of you. <laughs> and um, that's great, that's just great, because in Canada, I can't say that. <laughs> uh, well, maybe sometimes, but... Um, and then, with the air, so anything that is uh, related to air, basically, uh, in your lungs, breathing. Uh, so, and then... Um, if I'm not, I'll just use that chart because I want to use their words. Mm. Yeah, that's where, that's where uh, I find that, that's why I don't usually uh, kind of break it down because it, sometimes it's, it's a little confusing. But uh, that mentality or mind is nothing but contact sensation or feeling or experience then uh, whoa wait a minute I thought it was um, attention uh, perception uh, sensation uh, perception uh, attention and conscious uh, consciousness intention. intention and attention yes yes that's the one yeah but seeing that, well, I don't usually go into that because it's kind of confusing. Um, basically, um, you don't have to write anything. <laughs> well, I, I just say, like, for me, it's mind and body. And so that we understand body is the four great elements. And the mind is basically the, the rest of the five aggregates, the mental aggregates without the body and without consciousness. You switch, you switch consciousness out because it's the next one. And uh, you basically replace it by attention, basically, or is it intention or atten intention? Yeah. So, um, yeah. But that gets really theoretical, and that's why I don't like to spend, yeah. It's just like concepts, basically. <laughs> But I, I really like to think of it really in the way that of, like these are basically the five Panchupadanakandas. Like these are like the materials of that what we call ourselves basically. If we keep it simple, that's what it is, Nama Rupa. What is the cause for mind and body? I just said it. Consciousness should be answered. So the Buddha says, if there was not that consciousness, that uh, uh, that basically uh, is conditioned by the next one, but uh, that from all of our previous conditionings, and that now we're getting into the transcendental. But uh, yeah. If there wasn't, if there wasn't that consciousness, then uh, there wouldn't be descending into another mind and body. Basically, there wouldn't be a transition; uh, it would stop. But really, this is just consciousness. If you don't want to, <laughs> if you don't want to look into that, this is simply uh, consciousness. And the reason, some some of the discourses, the Buddha will say actually that. Okay, so dependent origination, like this is one way that he explains it. He explains it in different ways also. And he also explains it in a way that nama rupa and consciousness, they turn back to each other, basically. So you can't have, basically you can't have consciousness without nama rupa, and you can't have nama rupa without consciousness. Like mind and body and consciousness are, the, the Buddha uses the, the simile of the kusa grass. And then there's these two bundles of kusa grass, it's funny because I was just at, by the Naranjara River uh, in Bodh Gaya and I saw these like bunch of kusa grass and I was like, 
oh great, that's awesome. <laughs> Here's the simile. <laughs> and um, if you have the, the, the two stacks leaning on each other, basically you take one, the other one falls. Like there's, it's not gonna stand, basically. It loses its support. So, uh, so that's interesting so that we know also uh, another way of, uh, of seeing that. And what is the cause for consciousness? And this is Sankara, which Bhante would say formations, uh, or I call it mental activities, basically. There's so many ways of uh, calling that. I call them the mental processes or mental activities. Uh, which are fully conditioned, basically. This is basically the another way to talk about bhava. So when the volume has been turned up and the bhava has been conditioned a lot, this sense of identity, then it gets crystallized and then it takes, it takes action well, this is where these sankharas also arise, basically. This is that um, these, these sankharas are basically more or less happening on their own. They're conditioned habits of, of the mind. And um, they are either coarser or more subtle, depending. You can have a much lighter consciousness or a much heavier consciousness that is possible because I mean what we're doing is uh, like the definition of Nibbana which I think I'd like to give a talk on Nibbana later um, this is peaceful this is sublime Yadidang sabba sankara samato. So the tranquilizing, that is the tranquilizing of all formations, of all mental activities, all mental constructs, all mental fabrications. And if we can call them them, that means that they're a gauge, you know? <laughs> that there's coarser ones and then we can call them them too. So, uh, where, however strong the, the tanha, upadana, and bhava has been, the, uh, here the wanting, the attachment, and the sense of I, or what did I say, the habitual tendencies have become, then these sankharas will arise according to that strength, basically. So, oh yes. <laughs> Hacha. Okay. So, uh, usually we say there, there's the body and uh, body, speech and mind, sankharas, basically. Um, these are really, um, it, it's like I said here, there's so many ways of interpreting uh, dependent origination. So, one of the ways would be that uh, when we actually let go of all sankharas, the first one to go is the bodily, for example, someone who enters Naroda Samapatti, basically the complete uh, cessation. Uh, the first sankharas to go, which are the coarser ones, are the speech, because they are vitaka vichara, which is any kind of thinking or reflection. Then the bodily formations, which would be breathing, and then uh, and then the mental formations which are feeling or experience and perception are the last ones to go and these because we have a body anyways these arise like uh, pretty much automatically now there's like i said the word sankara can like there's so much to talk about just for that word so here, it, it's not just, for me, what, how I understand this is that it's not just about these three kinds of formations, but at that level, since we're already, you know, in, like, deep in the mental realms, uh, I think uh, it's really mostly about mentality here, like, it's the mental sankharas we're talking about. Uh, but once again, there's many ways of working with this uh, understanding, this chain. So, 
And I guess the other thing I, I should mention about that is that usually we think that Vijnana, this consciousness, is witnessing these activities, these sankharas. But the reality is that it's the other way around. And this is where we find this. And this is very, very important knowledge for us because uh, we also can understand that once we calm down all the sankharas, the consciousness doesn't have a support. So when all mental activities cease, there is no consciousness. It ceases. San, uh, vinyana, uh, sankara pachaya vinyana. So without mental activities, mental processes that are fabricated, conditioned through the whole chain, but now at this point they're just arising. Through the letting go of those, the releasing, the relaxing, uh, then consciousness loses its support completely. So, and, and, and in neither perception or non-perception and the clear mind, this is the place where you can actually see that for yourself here and now. And it's quite amazing because you will start to see that even consciousness itself is fully fabricated and it's arising and passing away and it's, uh, and it gets lighter and lighter and lighter and then there's a point where no, it's not really there anymore. And then there's, it kind of comes back a little bit and then it goes down again and then comes back a bit and there's this, I, oh yeah, like I, I wasn't kind of there anymore. That's why we talk about this stage of, it's not, you're not really asleep, but you're not really aware at the same time. Yes, and that's the kind of like the murky uh, <laughs> bits of, but it's very clear, like it, the mind is like extremely released, it's extremely sharp, but it's so sharp, it's so clear that it loses all of its compactness, it loses all of its substance, basically, because there's no more mental activities to activate it. So this is really uh, profound knowledge for, uh, for meditators who experience that, uh, that space. And to know that by releasing continually the sankharas that arise, the activities, then it is to be expected that consciousness will just basically dissolve and to, to, be, to enjoy. <laughs> and more and more we'll notice that just this I, just this being like, hey, I'm there, like, I am. And uh, it actually comes with tension. It's got tension in it because it's like, it's that little like awareness. But this is really subtle. And then that's training your mind to see the Four Noble Truths even to that level. So that's pretty, pretty powerful. So, okay, <laughs> let's get moving. So what is the cause for mental activities? Ignorance. Sorry? Ignorance. Ignorance, yes, avijja, which I call lack of discernment, should be answered. What is the exact meaning of discernment? Discernment. Discernment is like, uh, basically, like the... I don't know, like uh, telling, telling things apart, basically. How to tell things apart. This is uh, uh, discernment, like this is a sticky note and... Uh, distinguish. Huh? Distinguish. distinguish, yeah, discernment, yeah. It's, it's really close to like seeing clearly, again, it's, it's one of those, seeing yeah. Things seeing things as they really are, yeah. It works so well with everything when you look at it in that way and it's actually applicable, it really makes sense. Wisdom, well, yeah, we can talk about wisdom, but... <laughs> and then the word ignorance as well is like, okay, ignorance, like when I tell people that, usually they kind of like, they're pretty upset at me. <laughs> Sorry, bro, you're ignorant, you know, it's like, uh, <laughs> okay. It's pretty rough, you know, don't, don't say that in like, uh, I've, I've definitely learned that one, that's for sure. So as a teacher, you definitely get across that, especially in the West. And then there's ignorance. <laughs> it's like, not making friends. <laughs> definitely not. 
So lack of discernment though is quite wonderful because it ties into, you know, yeah, n n not panya, not, not, no, not having that discernment. You're not seeing, you don't have it, that, the awareness yet to, to see these things. And it's, it's a lot softer, it's a lot you know, less like kind of stingy, personal kind of thing. So, yeah, <laughs> lack of awareness, yeah. And it, it's just... Hmm? Yes, yes, of course, yes. So nobody's ignorant anymore. That feels just nice, right? <laughs> there can be a little lack of discernment one, once in a while, but nobody's actually ignorant. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, so now this is the interactive part, which is, gets fun, and it's going to go fast. So, well, fast in the sense that we're pretty much done the vibanga, the exposition of the whole thing. So. Here, in this way, monks, now we are going to do this together. I will say the first part and then you have to answer the, what the, the, the end is. Lack of discernment supports mental activities. Mental activities support consciousness. Consciousness supports mind and body. Yes, mind and body supports the six senses. The six senses support sensory contact. Sensory contact supports felt experiences. All felt experiences support wanting, craving. Wanting supports attachments. Attachments supports habitual tendencies or habit patterns. Habit patterns support blind reactions or have, uh, the birth of action. The birth of action or the blind reactions support trouble or suffering, dukkha. Then trouble supports, and now we get the test because we don't have that written on your sheet now. <laughs> Sadda. 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 Is that what you said? Suffering. So trouble, troubles, trouble brings about confidence. Yes, I want to change now, which is very close to Sangwega. Yeah. Confidence supports relief. Good pamoja. Relief supports. Joy. This is when it gets good. Yeah. Joy supports calm. Calm, tranquility. It's another word, pasadi. Calm supports happiness, ease, sukha. Happiness supports. Uh, and what is the the Pali for that? Samadhi. Good, good. Collectedness supports. Yes, very good. And see, that's where it's... Yes, very good. And see, the beauty of it is that it actually loops back to an actual... Uh, yeah, to the avijja, the lack of discernment. So it's really just completely integrated. Then this discernment, what do we do with this? This supports... Oh, this is the way it gets tricky. <laughs> Think about the ice cream. Nibiddha, yes, yes, Nibiddha, yeah. Yeah, disenchantment or what I said disengagement because it's, yeah, it's basically like, okay, it's that part we could even say viveka, that's where, that's where it is. Mm -hmm. So this disengagement and that's really where we kind of, okay, like we see what's going on and that's where we talked about why the Buddha started this sutta with anicca sanya, the perception of impermanence. Anicca, anicca. And um, when we start to see that, the more we disengage, the more we see anicca. The more we see that, because we're taking a step back, it's like, the, okay, and you're starting to see what's going on for real. And the more we take a step back, and, and, and the more we uh, see the, this impermanence, 
with discernment, the more we disengage, the more we disengage, the more we see the impermanence. So, just for you to nimble on tonight. <laughs> and then, discernment supports disengagement, and then this disengagement supports freedom from clinging. I'll help you with this one because it's <laughs> it's a little far now. It's been two and a half hours. <laughs> uh, so that's viraga, viraga. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, and this is, you know, viraga is basically saying like uh, vitanha, <laughs> you know, like uh, getting rid of that tanha, getting rid of like that, that craving, basically. Uh, freedom from clinging supports Vrimutti, release, release, yeah, because we're not clinging anymore, then there is release. Then this release supports the knowledge of stillness, basically, that asavakaya jnana. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the knowledge of the drying up of the effluence. <laughs> if you want to get nerdy about it. <laughs> yes, yes. The drying out of the juices. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's another way. <laughs> yeah, so this is what happens. And now back to the ecosystem analogy. It's beautiful because it's actually in the sutta, for real. <laughs> Now, just as when it pours down heavily on the mountain tops, that water rushes down, filling up the main valleys and gorges. The main valleys and gorges being full, they fill up the streams. The streams being full, they fill up the creeks. The creeks being full, they fill the rivers. The rivers being full, they fill the estuaries. The estuaries being full, they fill the great ocean. In the same way, monks, lack of discernment supports mental activities. Mental activities support consciousness. Consciousness supports mind and body. Mind and body supports six senses. The six senses support Sensory contact. Sensory contact supports felt experiences. All felt experiences support wanting. Wanting supports attachments. Attachments supports habit patterns. Habit patterns support blind reactions. Blind reactions support trouble <laughs> um, trouble supports confidence confidence supports relief relief supports joy joy supports yes calm supports happiness happiness supports collectedness collectedness supports Discernment, discernment supports disengagement. Disengagement supports freedom from clinging. Freedom from clinging supports release and release supports the knowledge of stillness. Very good. So now you know the whole way. <laughs> so with this, um, there's the analogy of uh, the rain falling into the mountaintops and gathering and gathering and gathering and collecting more and more and rushing down to the ocean of samsara. Basically, that's the classical understanding. And, uh, or you have the simile of the volume <laughs> for the music-oriented people. So that the more you turn up the craving volume, the more you feed the chain, the more it gets into the red zone. <laughs> the more it hurts the ears. <laughs> and so, to wrap this up, um, 
since we talk about the knowledge of stilling, this is also uh, what happens when uh, we have a clear and still mind, we see the impermanence of things. That's why I keep saying to everybody when there's a light arising, when there's a thought, when there's a person, when there's a pattern in the mind, uh, whether it's colors or whether it's uh, name it, whatever it is, only perceptions arising, passing away. Only thoughts arising, passing away. And what do we do? Six hours. <laughs> very good, very good. And we keep just being aware of that because that's what we're going to be aware of. It's just the flow of what is. So try not trying to make it this or that or me or mine. That's it. Until it dries up. <laughs> Very good. That was quick. Good. Good. Okay. Acha. So, are we ready to uh, take rest? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes? No, I raised my hand. I said, I'm ready. <laughs> oh. Mind objects, yes. Uh, mental states, mm, it really depends how you translate uh, the two last because, yeah, it's really, it's kind of tricky. Mind objects is dhamma. Yeah, mind objects would be dhamma or mental, mental phenomena. Chitta. Yeah. And then, and then mind would just be mind, mind as mind or chitta nupasana. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, but for me, the way I understand it is, yeah, like more like principles of dhamma, like dhamma, dhyan, yeah. It's just the operating system of the mind, basically. Uh -huh. I think I, I ask you whether you don't understand what is dhamma and dhamma nupashana and chitta nupashana. Yes. Yes. Sure yes. So, yeah, chitta nupasana is like knowing mind as mind. But, but that means, yeah, but that means like the general state of the mind, basically. Is the mind collected or is the mind scattered? Is the mind agitated or is the mind calm? Yes. But Dhamma, Dhamma Nupasana, is what, what's like the working of the mind, like the inner working principles. Like those are like the Dhamma principles that work in the mind. So when a hindrance arises, you know it as a hindrance. Not as, you know, this is me. This is, uh, oh, I really got to lock my car because, yeah. And uh, saying it's straight. And this is the content. Dhamma is content. Dhamma is? Dhamma is content. Yeah, but yeah, it <laughs> mental phenomena. Yeah, to me that's a wrong understanding, but <laughs> that's why I don't say it. But uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is, but it's, it's mistaken, like it's misleading because it makes the Chitta Nupasana and the Dhamma Nupasana really the same and they're not, like there's a difference between them, like mental states and then mental content, like what's the difference? Uh, so actually Dhamma Nupasana is actually seeing the Dhamma for what it is, like the inner working of the mind. When, when you sit down, you viveka, you let go, mind experiences, the seven supports of awakening, like it gets uplifted and then it calms down, it gets collected and it gets steady. That's the way the mind works, period. The characteristics of Dhamma, yes. There's Dhamma categories. Uh -huh. yes. A thought arises, 
that would be <laughs> well, it, it, yeah, I just, I'm just, basically, I'm just pointing out to what the Buddha says about it, basically. He's just, when he says Dhamma Nupasana, he goes into, okay, the five hindrances. What is Dhamma Nupasana? The five hindrances, the seven supports of awakening, the eightfold path, yada, 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 yada. So that's just like the Dhamma principles, basically. Yeah, the mechanics of the mind. So when a thought arises, you see it as a hindrance, basically. Or, you, you know, you see it, either you see it through the lens of um, citta nupasana, where you're like, your mind is agitated. You're not actually looking at the thought, that's the thing. It's like you're looking at the thought in like a scientific, like, like a scientist is looking at, yes, yes. Uh -huh. The thought, you're not looking at the thought or the content of the thought. It's just, it's a thought. It's restlessness. <laughs> yeah. Uh <-huh. laughs> yeah. <laughs> My, uh, okay, so I, I, have, I guess I have posted here. Maybe I already answered them. Vandami Bhante. What all fetters weaken, weakens go, slash goes away in sakad, Sakadagami and Anagami? Thank you, smile. Very nice. Um, Basically, uh, Sotapanna, Sotapati, uh, there will be uh, Sakaya Ditti, uh, the person view, basically, thinking that this I exists. It's not that it goes away completely, but it, it, theoretically, it is understood there cannot be a self. So the, the actual mana, like the ego pride, goes away at Arahanship. That's the other level of that. Uh, and then, and then doubt, and then clinging to rites and rituals, so Wichikicha and Silabhata Paramasa. And then what happens is that a person that attains this is usually known to have only seven more lifetimes in the sense realms, basically. So, um, but as they cultivate the mind, they develop the path, they will like who knows whenever are you uh, sixth lifetime are you fifth lifetime like how do we know this I don't know but at some point there will come a point that there will be one more lifetime and that's called Sakadagami a once returner and that person will return once in a sense realm it's either like the human realm is the lowest amongst them or yeah and then and then above is quite a few uh, so any of these states and the fetters that are let go of at Sakadagami, they're not actually let go of fully. And it's uh, craving or like sense desires and ill will or aversion or hatred. Basically, um, these are the next fetters in line that will start to dwindle. And at that point, the Buddha only says that there is a great reduction in... <laughs> sense desires and um, ill will or aversion yeah and that's I from what I understand is mm, yeah well basically yeah aversion towards others or towards the senses basically and so at that point it's 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 a little bit you know uh, when does that happen I don't know <laughs> it's not really clear but the next level anagami is quite clear and that's when you can really tell if someone is or isn't anagami because sense desires are completely abandoned and aversion is completely out of the game so these people cannot become angry and they cannot or or impatience for the same for the matter and they cannot have any kind of sensual desires and 
that even goes with uh, physical attraction. There's no more any of that. So uh, food, you know, like these are the two main, I think, uh, the biggest where to look really, if you want to know. Uh, so yeah. And then Arahant, well, obviously is, uh, yeah, wanting rebirth in, uh, in the form realm, wanting rebirth in uh, a rupa realm, and then there's uh, restlessness, mana, conceit, and ignorance, all vaporize. <laughs> so yeah, no more, uh, no more wanting. There's no more glue retaining the aggregates together, no more craving, and then when the body is laid down and broken, they dissolve, so. <laughs> Namaste, Bhanteji. I have, I have BP. What is that? Blood pressure. Oh, blood pressure. Oh. Contact. Is it, is it overcome by meditation? Is it overcome by, the, can it be overcome by meditation? What are the health benefits to our meditation students? Please clarify. Blood pressure. Well, there's so many. I mean, this is a kind of a general condition. So um, that can be, I think, triggered by a lot of things. <laughs> Um, definitely diminishing just the fetters that I just talked about, like anger or <laughs> things like that. Impatience will definitely reduce your blood pressure. <laughs> um, then uh, calming, yeah, just calming the body and the mind in general, like calming the mind to the deepest levels will assuredly help. And then uh, because the mind and the body are so uh, intimately intertwined, uh, it will be of great help. Uh, is it really going to solve the problem? Uh, I think this, I will leave that to doctors and uh, specific conditions and uh, things like that. But I, I, uh, I, I certainly, I've, I've definitely seen a lot of uh, conditions that left uh, because of meditation, because the, the mind does crazy things to our bodies and we don't even know we don't even know this like it's just once we let it go that we think oh wow that was just mental actually <laughs> i was like i was doing that to myself <laughs> so it's quite amazing the deepening process so i would say it's the same thing for blood pressure so mm. okay tk one last question. And karma. Um, well, once again, uh, these are two big words. <laughs> it's like, uh, do you want me to write uh, an essay about it? <laughs> um, yeah, but I, I know what you mean. I know what uh, I know what you mean. Uh, they're really closely intertwined. I mean, it's just, um, especially when you translate sankara as mental activities, karma, I mean, it's very, very, very close. But karma, I would say, is kind of a, like a broader kind of term which denotes like not only sankaras, but also the process of this whole chain of dependent origination, wholesome mental development, uh, bhavana basically um, and uh, but yeah it is so intimately intertwined I mean as we purify our minds we purify sankharas also we purify of craving and attachments and identity view and uh, that's all that's all karma um, and it's mediated through like Sankara. I would say like maybe like if you're a fan of the, the Matrix, the movie. <laughs> yeah. well, like the Sankaras are like the, the Matrix, you know, like that. <laughs> I think we all know what we're talking about here. 
And then karma is like everything that happens in the movie. <laughs> That's when you get into the matrix, that is karma. The what? When you get into the matrix, yeah. Karma. I mean, yeah. The the matrix is like the sankaras is like the building blocks of everything. It's like what it's all made of. That's what creates all of reality, and that's that's that matrix thing. And then whatever that matrix is saying, that reality that arises from it, well, that's the karma. That's whatever, and then whatever people do in their their guns and all that. <laughs> uh huh? When you were out of it, the sankaras fall. Sorry, when you're out of it. Yes. Yeah, well, if we go there, I mean, <laughs> yeah, you disconnect, <laughs> you're out of it. Well, but then, then there's that other thing. That starts again, and I don't know, like, I, I don't know where, yeah, yeah, but I would say, like, if you stop at the disconnect, and then you don't go into that other, like, human place that's, like, not in the matrix. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's uh, <laughs> that's pushing the analogy a little too far now. <laughs> yeah. So whatever is happening in there, it's like a, whatever is happening in like it's the same thing here. Whatever we're doing, it's all it's all created. It's all fabricated. The eightfold path. It's all fabricated. Everything. The whole teaching is all fabricated. You know, and like people ask the Buddha that, like, is it like well, is the eightfold path conditioned or not conditioned? He was like, well, it's fully conditioned. Everything is conditioned. The only thing that's not conditioned is Nibbana. So Sankaras are everywhere and everything we do, like uh, everything that I'm saying is, was, is Sankaras that I've accumulated through you know, all of the, the practice and studies. And so it's, it's just a matter of uh, uh, Kama Vipakka, basically, action and its results. But the building blocks of everything is all sankaras, basically. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> huh? No. Okay. Oh, yes, yes. Sharing. You're all holding the sharing merits page. Just like. A, Let's do it. <laughs> okay, I'll just let's just do the English tonight. <laughs> May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share these merits that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, Share these merits of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, have a beautiful evening and uh, I'll see you tomorrow on interviews. Uh -huh. Yes, yes, interviews again tomorrow. It's just a small interlude. Yes, feeling uh, a little bit more energy. <laughs> yes, that's good. And my uh, my stomach has been kind of doing things in the past three days, so that also took some of my energy. A few three days ago, I was wondering how the talks were going to go. <laughs> you didn't know that <laughs> it was happening in here. So um, yeah, take rest. Uh, see you tomorrow. Vittayam chakumai karaja Avisa vanno pata vipa bhaso Tang tang namasami harisa vanna Pata vipa bhaso Namad